Uh, evening and welcome to our um, Ask the Farmer Q&A session. My name is Bridget Barry and I coordinate Farming for Nature. I'm sorry for the delay tonight, but um, unfortunately our um, uh, Thomas's uh, Zoom is not working for him. We seem to be having this problem quite regularly with Zoom. But anyway, um, so we're actually going to interview Thomas over the phone um, and hopefully um, his partner can continue to try and access uh, getting into the, the, the session. So Farming for Nature was set up to inspire and encourage farmers that farm or wish to farm more with nature in mind. And each year we find exemplary farmers, uh, our ambassadors that are doing extraordinary work for nature on their farms. And um, this Q&A session is a great way to learn about their practices and how they're doing it. So over the next hour, um, hopefully, uh, myself and Brendan, my co-host, um, Brendan is a volunteer with Farming for Nature, but his day job is running the Burn program up in County Clare. Um, myself and Brendan will uh, throw some questions out to Thomas, and then we ask you if you have any questions to pop them into the chat box um, on, uh, at, uh, on your banner, and we'll get around to facilitating as many of these as possible. So tonight we're delighted to, um, our guest speaker is Thomas Puhi uh, from County Cork, and Thomas is a mintil, arable, uh, stockless farmer, and um, he's organic, and he's um, both keen on building up and maintaining the fertility in his soil. He's got a huge amount of speciality crops like linseed, lupins, uh, and sunflowers, as well as traditional grains growing. Um, Thomas, thanks very much for joining us, and I'm sorry for the hassle of um, that is the world of Zoom. Um, but thank you for joining us. Um, welcome. Thomas, you might just start with your own journey into agriculture and how you got to where you are now. Um, can you hear me there, Bridget? Yeah, I'm yeah. Okay there on the phone. Uh, yeah, um, um, I, I was always part-time and um, um, I was working off the farm as well and we were conventional. Um, and um, 10 years ago, I... Um, we just said this the amount of land I have, I said it, it, it's not working. And um, I was always conscious of, of growing things and being interested in nature and stuff like that and whatever. And we looked into organics. And um, at the time, everybody probably thought we were at our head. And um, we said, uh, no, I said, I will have a go at it. And um, basically speaking, it has been the best thing I've ever done in my life. And um, we haven't looked back, and uh, I'm, that's where I am here today. And um, it, it was, it was, you could say, it was also necessity more than anything else. But this is, um, it marked into something totally different when we went into it because uh, the avenue that it can actually open up and things like that. So um, yeah, it's 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 been um, it's been an interesting ride so far, anyways, and um, hopefully it will um, it's going to get better. Brilliant. Uh, Thomas, you might just explain for us uh, your farming system. So what your what your farm looks like, but also what you know, what is your what's your actual system? Uh, my system is is because I, I, I am I'm stockless and, and because it was conventional and my organic matter would have been on a very low base. And I basically had to start building my soil microbiology, my my carbon, and um, basically um, I had to do it in such a way because I'm stockless. I had to do it through uh, cover crops and green manures. And why, if some people see what, what my rotation is, you would be scratching your head, right? Because it, it's probably the most diverse rotation you'll probably come across. And uh, especially, especially the, the types of rotation, but, but there, there, there's, a, there's an actual reasoning behind every, every, um, every crop I grow financially, yes, and also what they actually do uh, to the soil and um, what they do to um, basically nature, insects and biodiversity. So um, it was only when, when I got the interview there last year and you popped out um, to see me, um, I, I took for granted a lot, which is amazing, I took for granted quite a lot of what I actually had in the farm and because it, it, it was just there and I, it, I was nearly oblivious to some of it and um, 
it was pointed out to me on the day, you, you have yellow hammers and you have this and whatever and stuff like that. And I just go, oh yeah, I have, yeah. And, um, you know, um, maybe it's because I, I, I was in Baltimore and it actually evolved around me. I, I actually didn't realize that the, the, the huge debt to biodiversity I had actually created as a result of my family practice. Mm. I know when I when I first spoke to you, I mean at that particular stage, which was you know probably May of last year, you had about ten acres of flowers, it, it flowering at that stage like lupins and and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how do you choose what flower like what you're going to plant and you know what you what, what you plant each year? How do you choose your rotation? Well, um, I choose the rotation on the basis of. Of, of my planting is down to the availability of, of nitrogen fixing, which is legumes. And it would be, let's say, I will grow linseed, and linseed would be a very good crop for me, and it, it, it's, it's vital in the rotation. And what linseed does is, as well as giving me a cash crop of, of linseed that I actually sell up the country to Adora Flax, and, and it is a host for. Um, Mycorrhiza and mycorrhiza fungi are, 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 are absolutely key to, to um, the, the health of the plant and soil microbiology. So, but what it does as well is, is it makes unavailable pea in the ground, natural pea in the ground, not duck, it makes it available for itself and it also makes it available for the next crop. But um, what it does as well then is because of the flowering nature of it, it flowers for about two weeks. And, and, and it, 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 it's quite unusual because the flowers open in the morning, Bridget, and in the afternoon, the evening, all the petals fall down to the ground, and you will have new flowers coming on every day. And they finish the flowering after about 10 days to two weeks, and, and you would basically, the whole ground is covered in blue flowers. <coughs> it, it's actually, you, you, you wouldn't see it at the end of it, but when you pull back, just the there's a carpet of blue petals on the ground is absolutely amazing. But, but what it does is, is bees, insects, the, the whole place is buzzing. But what, with that then, what you have at that time of the source is the, is the lupins. And I grow lupins for um, protein, for, for animal feed. And um, the lupins are fantastic as a host for as well. They're a fantastic, a fantastic host. For, for mycelium fungi, mm -hmm. which in turn break down all the straw on the ground and make it available for, for the worms and make it available for, for the, the, the lower range of, of, of the microbiology to actually use again as, as basically um, a form of a carbon that can be broken down easily. So that's a tap root as well. And that also makes tea available for other crops and it breaks down other nutrients because it's a tap root. And what it does is more than anything is it's the diversity then of the insects and the pollinators that actually jump from one crop into the other. So um, with that flowering then, what I had then is I had a hectare of lentils last year that um, I harvested, and lentils being an indeterminate plant, they were flowering for nearly two months at a time. Mm -hmm. So I had basically every swallow in about a five mile radius over that hectare of, of um, lentils when, when I was um, weed sourcing it. And um, basically they were having the feed of their life for about two months. And um, it was basically a host when you're driving through it, you'd see the odd hedgehog and um, you'd see shrews and um, of course you see the foxes running down inside in the middle of that. So so you, you had some, some ground nesting birds and things like that in it as well. But, um, you must be the only person in Ireland growing lentils, are you? <laughs> I'm the only person in Ireland that does grow lentils. <laughs> yeah. But they actually, it, it works and uh, as a as a crop, you, you're... Oh yes, I, 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 and lentils are a legume as well. And, and what I'm trying to do, Bridget, is, is, is add value and, and grow, grow more crops for human consumption. <laughs> and someone said to me, focusing in on, and yes, it is, but, but it, it's also in, 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 it just has to be in tune with nature. Mm -hmm. and, and this wouldn't be possible because I'm organic, right? And because uh, 
my uh, of the understanding I had. I'm I I call myself a biological farmer as well, or, 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 or some people call me is is that I'm a carbon farmer. Mm-hmm. And I temporarily sequester carbon at a higher level. I sequester it at a lower level in the taproot, but I use that carbon basically as a food source for the microbiology for the following crops. Okay. That's really fascinating. Um, just quickly, where are your market for these crops? You, I mean, you were saying the lupins goes into animal feed and stuff. I, is there a, a huge market for the these speciality crops? Yes, and there's a huge growing market for them. Um, and let's say my, I, my bread and butter would be let's say oats, or two got a slab and for 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 porridge, and um, I grow wheat, and um, we. The wheat would tend to grow in the mini wheat that we'll be trialling it. It would tend to grow to annual feed or basically some and and millers. And um, the mean, sea goes, goes where it is. I started growing um, emmer and iron corn, which are ancient grains as well this year. And um, the iron corn wasn't too successful, but the emmer was a fantastic success. So I'm growing more of that. What, what people might be interested in this year coming is I'm growing um, two hectares of a uh, candy crop of chickpeas, and um, I'm also growing um, buckwheat for flour. So um, that's another that's another crop again with with a, with a, a long flowering um, um, season as well. And it. so um, yes, it could be. It would be quite nice to see the whole place and so I'd like from one to the other. And, yeah. Um, yeah. And when you choose crops. when you choose your crops, sorry Thomas, sir. When you choose your crops, um, I mean like chickpeas, I didn't know people could, could grow them here. I, I didn't know they were growing here. But um, I mean, are you kind of, are you the first people, are you one of the first people to grow them in Ireland or is there, you know, is there other people? Yeah, um, to, be, to be honest. To put two yeah, hectares to it is a huge amount like, you know. Yeah, conventional farming bridges, they say they're, they're in a situation where they have to take what a worldwide commodity is growing at, and, and they won't even try any of these crops. Whereas the likes of organic farming, it opens the doors because because of, of the, the farming practices and because of the rules and regulations. And it allows people, which I think is fantastic for Irish people. And it, it, people know are looking at smaller farms and they're looking at viability of smaller farms and, and diversifying. And it, all of these things, it's 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 something you can actually start an on farm after the food business with. And it allows you to do that, but it also allows you because you're farming with nature and you're farming all with with you, and you don't have you don't have let's say the cost and cost in the pesticides and fungicides and artificial fertilizers and stuff. But, but what you have is you you, you have a food, you have an artisan product that's true to your you, yourself, and you have look at what it's doing. The consumer can actually see the, where it's coming from. It can talk to the person, and it can actually see where the seeds are, where it's actually grown in, in the seeds. So it's a and. Um, I, I think that there's, there's, there's such um, an opportunity for people in this country to actually um, take up on, on, on some of the possibilities in this, you know? Yeah. So just yeah. going back a step there, um, the Thomas there is, I mean, you're min-till, so that yeah. you do min to, uh, minimal tillage, um, but you're not no-till. And I know, I remember when I saw you speaking at the bio farm this year you were saying in the irish context like uh, on the international context no-till works quite well but you were saying in the irish context mintil is actually where the balance is is correct for the irish soil can you just explain that for us yes um it, it's that we have a unique um, no tilling works very well in in a climate with seasons and um, we have um, a maritime climate and truthfully, Bridget, we really don't have a season. You know, you know what people say, we can have four seasons in one day, which basically means that, that you do have a difficulty in terminating weeds and you, 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 there is no dormancy as such. So I choose minimum tillage. And what, what that does is, is it keeps the most microbiology, the most active 
microbial size at the top five, five to ten centimeters of the fly, and, and that's where all your plant life and roots tend to to germinate from at the start, and where everything is broken down. Let's say I'm looking at it. If you go down to a field, or you go to a ditch in the side of the road, or you go into a forest, okay, the natural progression in the soil is whatever this or fall off trees and the grapes, or whether it's ditches, or whether it's grasses that decay, they could become humus and they're humified into the ground and they work the way down into the soil. That's, that's what I'm trying to achieve. And what the minimum tillage does as well is it controls the weeds to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. What it does more than anything is it breaks down and mulches the litter from the crop previous. If I had things like red clovers or crimson clovers for fertility building and for nitrogen fixing, it mulches them in and it makes it a more available nutrient source for the crops I'm planting. So that's what I'm trying to mimic nature by doing something like that. Within, within, within the parameters of growing in the time that we have here in Ireland. Okay. And then the other thing is, is I mean, I remember you saying that, you know, you rarely leave any soil bare for any time. So obviously yeah. you're planting your cover crops, um, you know, around your cash crops. Um, so can you explain, you have touched on it a bit, but you might just explain for people the importance of that and, um, you know, an and a few examples of what you're actually doing in that area. Yeah, well, I'm actually, I, I, even other than a cover crop, I, I undercrop as well, I understory to basically, they call it a living mulch. And if you take it from the start of the year when, when I plant my crops in the spring, um, when they come out of the ground, they're cash hot, so I must make them the dominant crop. And shortly after tillering, after my weeding, um, I will plant um, into that crop and the likes of uh, crimson clover and trefoil and black medic as a, as a mix underneath the crop. And what that does is that fixes nitrogen. We also fix the nitrogen for the following crop. Mm -hmm. So when I cut my cash crop in the autumn, that then opens up for, for, the, for more photosynthesis to get back down into that carpet that's actually underneath that crop and that takes off. But what I do then, straight after that is after chopping the straw is I till the ground very lightly not to terminate the mulch crop but to put in a crop over the winter the likes of a rye and a tritty kale and um, an oat mix and what that does is it mops up all the, all the nutrients that are left over and available from that crop but why it's so important to do that is by not leaving the soil bare it means that I am building um, underneath the ground. Uh, what most people don't realize is it's the root biomass is more important under the ground than at the actual biomass that you're building over the ground from a microbiology point of view and from a carbon point of view and from a point of view of that basically storing nutrients. So that's what I would do. And in the spring again then, that's much back down and I would plant my cash crops again and I would put an undercropping of a mulch crop again underneath that. So what I'm doing is I'm constantly feeding the crop, but when that crop is harvested, I'm feeding a cover crop to keep the soil covered over the winter. And that helps basically, if you don't keep it covered, your microbiology has nothing to do with us mm -hmm. because it's a symbiotic relationship. The microbiology needs the plants and the plants need the microbiology. So what you need to do is you need to keep both happy so you keep you keep a living crop at all times in the ground. That's why uh, lay ground or, or, or grass, uh, multi-species swabs work so well because they are never terminated and they're always growing. Yeah, fascinating. That's really important. Um, I, I received a question earlier today from someone, a participant tonight, and she was just asking, she said, obviously, you're organic and you don't use fertilizers, so how do you kind of build up the fertility in your soil? And uh, you've covered it a lot. Is there anything else you'd like to add to that question, to that, uh, to answer to that question? Um, in the absence of fertilizers and fungicides and insecticides and everything that a conventional farmer might be using, um, where's your successes and where what, what do you use? 
Right. Um, first of all, um, I I take the top on my straw, okay? And um, I also give straw to a neighbour across the road and I get that back in, in Sam Allen Newer. Not a whole pile of it, but basically that, that nutrient source is actually brought in not a whole pile. But what, what people might be aware of this, right, is soils in Northern Europe, in the Northern Hemisphere, would have enough available uh, P and K and nutrients to sustain constant cropping for in excess of three to four hundred years. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. So what I'm doing is the crops are basically mining them in the field. And if people say, why don't you import these these rock potash and phosphates and things like that? It's from, from, a, from, a, from a point of view, we're all living in the one planet and it's the same as taking it from one side of the world and giving it to the other. Um, there's a finite resource of that in both countries as well. Mm-hmm. I have it on my doorstep. So what I'm doing is with my plants, I, I, the only thing I'm actually taking off the field, if you look at it, is the actual grains themselves. Everything that the green grew on is actually being mulched back down into the soil again. So basically, that's where I'm coming from. Whereas um, conventional farming nowadays, the best way to do it is because it is solid with fertilizers and PK, trace elements and nitrogen, soil has actually become irrelevant. It's only a medium to grow the crop because they will they will take a, a pesticide or fungicide or a, a trace element off the shelf and spray it, or they will put out fertilizer and uh, feed the crop. So, so, the, so what's happening in the fields has become irrelevant to the farmer. So um, they've basically forgotten about nature as mm-hmm. such. Talking of nature, actually, um, I really liked when Clive Bright nominated you last year. So Clive Bright's one of our ambassadors and yeah. uh, he nominated you last year. And I, I loved his sentence, which said, you know, when you were lo- walking along and, uh, you know, you saw a hedgehog with her little hoglets yeah. walking past you nonchalantly, that you kind of realised you were doing something r- uh, right. You might just explain for us, like, what other, you, you kind of mentioned at the beginning, kind of yellow hammers and stuff, but have you seen a lot of kind of, return of nature on your farm I, I mean I know you, you have said to me in the past that you're not farming for nature it just happens that what you're farming is completely nature friendly you know there's a lot of pollinators and stuff but um are you I mean are you different to a lot of your neighbors and what you might see on your farm Thomas oh totally look I'll give you I'll give you an instance and um, all the farms are on me and even the other half of the farm and farm would have the the hedges with their short backs and sides. And basically every year after September, those farmers would beat the hedges back into submission. And um, I didn't. But, but I actually trimmed the hedges every other year, okay? Mm-hmm. But what I did was, for the first two years I didn't when I went into it, and I trimmed them back the year after that, and it's every other year I trim the sides just back. But what I've done is, my ditches, I have let the hedges grow out one and a half metres approximately at each side, and I have never cut the top of the hedge since. Mm-hmm. So I'm leaving it like a, a pyramid style, mm-hmm. okay? But what I've done, when, when people don't use the likes of, likes of say, male ditches, what they've done is, when people are spreading artificial fertilizers near their ditches and they're beating it into submission every year, the, the diversity is going because it's been overtaken with the likes of fevers and, and, and weeds that are actually nutrient hungry. So, what I did was it took a couple of years, right? But in the evenings there now, when they're in full bloom, I have all my white tongs, black tongs, everything like that. So you're walking down through there. But what has come in underneath as well is the ivy has returned in underneath. And what the ivy has done in the ditches, it has created a microclimate and it has created a habitat. And, and it's a habitat for solitary bees and things like that. And a lot of what, let's say, branches, strong branches that are cut off the ditches, which is right, mm. I would actually put up on top of the ditch to write that down, and that basically gives a habitat for the legs of your millipedes and centipedes and your, your beetles and arthropods and spiders and everything like that. Mm-hmm. But 
My native indigenous grew old more. What has happened is I'm protecting it, 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 it's a habitat for, for, for insects alone inside there that they feel safe. Mm-hmm. But in, what, what has happened with me, if you close your eyes now, you walked up in the evenings because what I have brought back in again is when you don't cut the ditches like, like before and beat them into submission, I have rose hips again everywhere and the rose hips climb up. They climb up to the right arm and they climb up on the sycamores and uh, I have honeysuckle back in again and honey, you, you smell it before you see it. Mm-hmm. And um, what has happened as well that way again is I have uh, crab apples and um, you will have your foxgloves and you will have your primroses early in the spring. But, but you have an ivy which, which, which is a source for the bees and a source for pollinators and then um, basically a habitat for nesting birds. So what it, what it is, is I have one spine running down through my my my, uh, my farm, right? That I have it, it's next to a passageway and a farm of all sides of it. And it, in the evenings there at dusk, it, it, it's like the M1. It, it's mm-hmm. so busy because you can see the bats out at both sides of it and mm-hmm. you actually you see you see the owl just passing at both sides of it. And, and the predators are just starting to come out at night and things like that. And, and the whole place is alive. It's a bit like, um, let's say, everyone is going to work in the mornings or coming home in the evening. Mm-hmm. They're, just, they're just out for the evening. But, 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 but the, the complexity, that has naturally come back in, whether, whether it's roses, whether it's your, your regular blackberries, whether uh, for, the rest of the, for the rest of the season then, the, the amount of food that you've actually created on the hedgerows yeah. basically keeps keeps keep, keeps um, all the, the smaller birds, it basically keeps them fed for the winter. Mm-hmm. And um, that, that would also be the case from, let's say, losses from the combines after the likes of the lid seed and things like that. You have lots of seed and, and you have lots of things like that. That's basically, um, it, the sunflowers would be good for us, the, 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 the small um, finches and the blue kids and things like that. They would basically pick the head of all the sunflowers clean. Mm-hmm. They, like, they, they like the seed. God, it's lovely. It sounds like, you know, you've got a lovely kind of growth of biodiversity. Like you said, the roots and underneath and then, you know, things are feeding off all the seeds and the, and the flowers and the pollinators and then you've got these kind of green veins going through the farm as well. No, it's it's a... It's, uh, Sounds like a lovely, inspirational farm, Thomas. And um, just quickly there, and then I'll hand you over to Brendan. If you were looking for advice, and where do you look for advice and support um, when you're carrying out, you know, the, the, you're obviously a bit of a trailblazer, Thomas, in terms of what you're growing, but where do you find your advice and support when you are looking for uh, different ideas and stuff around farming for nature and farming practices, et cetera? Um. It's honestly, it's quite scarce in this country. And what, um, when I did the MSc in Scotland on the organic agriculture, that did open a lot of avenues for, for, for resources and where I could look at things and um, connected me with, with, with different um, different people involved in that side of it. And there was a huge amount actually going on in, in Europe at the moment and from, from a biodiversity point of view. And um, I would look, look to a lot of the, the biodiversity um, um, sites in, um, in Europe. And um, the, to be fair, the, the UK are, are absolutely fantastic um, and from, from a nature point of view and stuff like that. They're, they're big into, uh, I know, rewilding might be a bit step too far and things like that, but mm-hmm. the University of Farmers and Agroecology and things like that, that's fantastic. And, um, um, they have Siebel, the, the site in Switzerland has uh, a most fantastic um, uh, biodiversity section there. That's really what people, if you want to see what trialing is going on. Can you repeat um, that again? Siebel. Sorry, what was that? What, Sorry, the w- F-I-B-L. F-I-B-L, okay, yeah, site in Switzerland. Okay, okay if people want to look that up, it, it, it's mainly, the mainly be with, with trialing our, our, our organic um, Agriculture, but but they also they are also very big into trials of biodiversity. They absolutely phenomenal what, what they're they're doing. They would have a, a certain uh, a separate section on it. Okay. And um, 
you you get fantastic points of, of what they're up to there. But they're they're really pretty they're really big into um even though I don't do that, they're into multi species swords and multi species in flowering swords um, and marginal areas. Um, of the country, which could be promoted, let's say, even in the likes of this country. Let's say, I, I know we have a big cross of the barn and things like that, but um, they're promoting multi species of flowering plants mm. um, to maybe 60 and 70 different species, and um, they will be looking at lowland and, and upland and hill areas and stuff like that. And they're actually getting phenomenal results from, from the, the cattle and the cows and things like that. And, mm, okay. um, Brilliant. Um, Yes. Very interesting. Listen, I'm going to hand you over to Brendan now. He, uh, he'll um, just be asking there a few questions. For everyone in the audience, thank you for your patience. We're really sorry that Thomas hasn't been able to join us via computer, but I hope you can hear him well enough through the phone. Um, and if you have any questions, please pop them into the chat box. Feel free to, and we'll try and get around to as many as possible. Thomas, um, I'm going to hand you over to Brendan Donford, uh, who's um, co-founder of Farming for Nature and works on the Burn program. And uh, so stay with us there. Brendan, over to you. No problem. Thanks, thanks Bridget. And uh, thanks very much, Thomas. Um, that's 30, 30 minutes of actually fascinating content. And Bridget described you as a pale baser, which I think is entirely appropriate. I think what you're doing, is, um, is it's very inspiring. Um, I think we talk a lot about challenges and problems and issues and why this can't be done, but I think you, people like yourself and our other ambassadors as well show, show us that there are solutions out there that do work and have been proven to work. Um, Thomas, I just had a, there's a lot of questions. So I'm, I'm not gonna ask too many myself. I'm gonna forward on the other questions in, in a moment, but just could you tell us a small bit about um, the farm itself, were you born into the farm? Did you uh, uh, buy it or have, what's the history of the farm itself? Yeah, um, my parents had the farm and um, yeah, I, I, I acquired half the farm. The other half of the farm is still, is still um, farm conventionally. And um, yeah, um, my side of it is farmed, as you say, unconventionally. But um, as people know, um, before the before World War One, uh, organic farming was conventional farming. It's only since the advent of, of pesticides and fungicides and um, things like that that um, that, um, that has become um, um, conventional farming. So um, that's quite mm -hmm. a right or wrong. Uh, uh, looking here, Brendan, I. I I might have you up here now tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know. But um, I'm trying my best anyway. And no, I can, we can hear you. Line, line broke up a small bit there, um, unfortunately, but, but, but that's fine. Um, no, I was just interested in, 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 in how you came around to the type of farming um, that you did. What, what, what inspired you to take I, the path that you're currently on? Sorry, Brendan, could you hang on one second? I think you're actually on the on the computer here, Thomas. Are oh, you? Oh, oh, yes, you're here, Thomas. So you just have to unmute there, Thomas. Uh, hold on there. Okay, Thomas, I can see you now. Okay. No. Can you hear us, Thomas? I see Thomas there, but I don't know. I see him, and hopefully you can hear us there, Thomas. Can you? Thomas, you just have to turn up your. Um, we can't hear you. Thomas, we can't I hear you. I have it. Oh, oh, Lord. Oh, there you go. Now, now, now we can hear you. Can you hear us okay, Thomas? I can, yes. Can you hear me? Perfect. <laughs> just like making. It's like making contact with the moon, a mission to the moon or Mars or somewhere. <laughs> so thanks so much. And I, listen, thanks. You can, you, can, you can thank my wife for that. <laughs> she was she's the IT in the background. Well, thanks very much, Margaret. And you know what, uh, Thomas, you're, you're such a compelling speaker anyhow that I think everybody who joined uh, the meeting earlier on is still with us. So we didn't even lose any audience members, but we're delighted to see you and uh, to put a face to the voice. So, so thanks for joining. No, we were just chatting there, Thomas, about I just you, just you and your family. So you you um, you grew up on the farm and you started kind of taking following your own path. 
could you point to a moment in your in your experience where you decided that you wanted to do things differently, that you wanted to take a different path from from maybe your neighbours and the the, the, the 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 people around you? Um, I, I probably what was a compelling moment, Brendan, was when um, I wanted to start because I was working off the farm. I I, I just it's either in you or it's not sometimes and whatever and i just said uh, i just wanted to get out of the rat race but basically what i wanted more than anything was i wanted down the road to actually start an on-farm enterprise whether it was an artisan food business or something i just wanted the farm to actually work for me in a way that conventional farming wouldn't and let's say if there's farmers listening tonight, right, the, the pride you get, let's say, if, if you're walking in the evenings, you look at a crop or, or, or little things in nature, um, just it gives you a smile. You you just, it, it's something that just, just it just ticks the box somewhere. You can't explain it. And y, y, it's a satisfaction. If, Brendan. So, um, yeah, and I think that's a really important point when we talk about farming and we talk about the bottom line and we talk about the technology, but actually there's a whole social dimension around well-being and the beauty of farming and the joy that you get from it. I think it's good that you, it's really important that you mention that. Um, when you describe your farming system, it's, it's kind of extraordinary. You seem to be farming soil, essentially, but the crops that you choose to, to, to deliver every year, is that you decide to grow chickpeas and then you look for a market or... Does the market dictate what you plant? No, let's say I, I was, my wife was demented because of the amount of trialing of different crops I do. And um, she said, if you just grow oats, you will make more money. So um, I, I've been trialing, I've tried the, um, the lentils for three years before I managed to get the agronomy right. And the same with the chickpeas. So um, I, I'm dipping into them this year from a two hectare plot. So um, I find a market first and I work back and I see is it possible. Um, maybe that's because I, I have been working outside the farm for a long time and because I'd be looking at what the consumer wants. And um, that's the way I approach the cropping. So. Um, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a method in my madness. And Thomas, um, another question with regard to, um, I suppose, the, 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 farming, the farming system and how, how you do what you do. Um, in terms of the, um, the, the, the you, you seem to deliver, you know, um, very nutritious food. Can you capture the nutritional value of your food in any way? And does that add to the value of the product? And likewise, with the other deliverables, carbon is obviously, um, you're sequestering a lot of carbon into the soil. Your hedgerows sound fantastic for biodiversity. Is any of that um, environmental dividend um, reflected in, in, in what you can charge for your food? Um, well, uh, Brendan, I'd look at it from the point of view of, uh, and if there's anybody else listening tonight and they are artists and producers are thinking about it, um, by doing it this way and hoping to, to go direct to the consumer, um, you're actually cutting out the middleman, and and it, it's that profit margin maybe from from um, from maybe two middlemen that, that makes the difference. But if if I add to this in another context, um, I I don't think that the awareness of our surroundings and nature and the awareness of food would have been at a level it is now only for the advent of COVID. I know it has been absolutely, a, it's, it is a horrendous uh, position we're all in, but it has also made people aware of when they went out walking, they become aware of something that they were oblivious to because they were too busy in their jobs up to this. And they were aware of the quality of food, which were they were oblivious to, or will have a takeaway and things like that. And people went mad baking and things like that. But, uh, and they went into gardening and polytunnels have taken off again in a big way. So I actually think that, that 
it's been an, a fantastic journey for everybody in Ireland. If they'll actually stand back and get back from the cloud of COVID at the moment and look at what they've rediscovered in Ireland again, that'll bring a smile to their, their, their faces as well. And look, going forward, look, look at the dividends it could actually bring and open up a whole new um, industry in this country. You know, not that it's being pushed anywhere at the moment by, by um, the powers that be. Yeah. And Tom, Thomas, just one more general question, and then I'll go to the, a very busy chat. There's tons of questions in for you. Um, like what you do is obviously wonderful for, 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 I think, in terms of the quality of the food and the biodiversity and the carbon. If, if, if you were to sort of see that to scale, because obviously there's urgent biodiversity and climate crises, what do you think farmers need to make that change at scale, like a large number of farmers moving moving in the direction, um, not quite as far as you've gone, perhaps, but moving in that direction, because I'm sure a lot of farmers would like to farm in a way that, that gives them a good income and that's kind to nature and gives them a good sense of well-being. But what is it a policy or is it a change in, in food prices or routes to market? Or what do you think can make the big, big difference? Um, a big difference is 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 promoting um, promoting the the food that is possible to have produced in this country under 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 this regime. But Brendan, when when I did my masters, uh, I actually did a survey in Ireland for my thesis of, of organic farmers, and um, a lot of the questions were. As, was was around all of this right but one of the questions the, the, they were very honest with me and afterwards there was one question is there anything you'd like to add and um it, it was confidential and um the majority of them said basically over fertility and weed pressures and marketing lack of agronomic education was their biggest stumbling block in looking outside the main sources of agriculture. Uh, we, we've tunnel vision at the moment, and it, we are going to end up in it. It is going to land us in trouble. I think that your medium-sized family farm with a diverse streams of income in the farm has a place if they can be upskilled to produce a product that is being imported into this country and give them a very comfortable return with a very high satisfaction rate. And it, it's something rather than all you, the doom and gloom at the moment you're hearing is, if you don't get big, get out or give it to a big guy. That is going to destroy our social fabric out the countryside. And we have a chance to actually build our fabric again from from people working from home at the moment and COVID and people are working in rural areas with the likes of broadband and stuff like that, right? If your if you're small, diverse family farm can actually diverse into other things, change is good, okay? And diverse into other cropping, other artisan foods. And um, I actually think if there's a platform and other countries are doing it, which I have seen it in other countries and it's, and I come back here and you look here then and there's absolutely, there's, there's no, there is no support whatsoever and there's tons of it in other countries. People don't realize that other countries and other people in other countries have a perception of what Ireland is as, as a food producing country from clean air and from a maritime climate and things, things like that and from holidaying here, I actually think we should totally capitalise on the likes of that and, and give them the product they're looking for. Reece, that's, um, just that's, 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 that's really called to arms. Um, that's really call to arms, Thomas. So thanks very much. Now, listen, we've got a ton of questions, an absolute ton of them. <laughs> so, so I'm going to call them out. And I'm going to ask Tom what his experience of growing soybeans was. How was weed management and yield? And is there any crops that could be intercropped with the soy? Sorry, um, could you repeat that again, Brendan? You were breaking up slightly. Sorry. 
Sorry, Tom. Um, it's about soybeans. What was your experience of growing soybeans and how is weed management and yield? And do you have any crops that you could intersow with the soy? Right. Um, number one, I had to get a lot of paperwork to get soybeans um, because um, the majority of soybeans are genetically modified. So I had to get a very old variety from Germany. And um, if people are interested, the pigeons love them. They are absolutely addicted to them and um, they have a problem in this country with ripening and um, it's at the moment even in an intercropping situation I didn't find them feasible but uh, I grow lupins and lupins are known as um, a cool the northern cool hemisphere version of soybeans because they're within two to three percent protein of um a soya bean and a lupin can be um, fed to um, pigs and poultry at any at any level uh, of of inclusion in their feeding and they do absolutely fantastic on it and uh, on a side note to that if people are interested in New Zealand they give small amounts of um, a lupin grain to sheep before they put them in lamb and it makes them up to 30% more fertile so it's, it's just one of these things that um, that they found out by mistake really but um, soya beans in Ireland I wouldn't go there okay um, if you need it other than that uh, other than tofu or something like that I, I, I'd, um, I'd shy away from it at the moment but um I, I tried the lentil side of things. It, it, it's a far better bet. Okay. And with the lentils, where do you sell them? Um, Celine wants to know. Well, at, at the moment, I, I'm 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 recleaning them. I, I'm selling them to close friends and things like that at the moment. But I'm um, I'm actually uh, what I say. Um, hopefully, after this harvest coming, I will I'll I have my own website set up and I'll be selling them either direct or um, through farmers markets and things like that with, with some other seeds as well and things like that. I think there's a market for people if they want to um, buy whole seeds from from people rather than having them. Let's just say um, having them imported from China, I, I don't think is um, a wise decision. And some of the stuff I, I would I would be slightly dubious about 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 some of the traceability and things like that and um not casting any aspersions but um paper trails can have a have a problem of getting lost um because i i was involved in um in the innovator farmers in mole valley is a big cooperative in the south of england and um it was to get more farms to grow lupins in the uk and i was involved in it uh, because they had a problem they were bringing in lupins for the dutch of cornwall's chickens and um, for their feeding and um, the mafia in latvia and lithuania had come along and they had falsified the organic paperwork and uh, they got the lupins a boatload of lupins tested in rotterdam and they had every it was a 10 band pesticides and fungicides uh, showed up in the mix and that's what it came back to that was quite lucrative for the for the mafia to actually start um, counterfeiting um, um, paperwork for for, yeah. for uh, to make it organic which was non-organic just one of those things so it, it's good to keep yes it, it uh, stay stay close to home for um, for your traceability i think that, that makes more sense than ever at the moment k quinn thomas wants to know just in general about the viability of the system and obviously you work very hard and does it do you sort of does it does it does it and um, wash its face i suppose the, the system of farming that you have oh yes but let's be honest um um uh, you have to be a smarter farmer to farm organic than you do conventional because let's say you, you have to plan ahead okay and I, I i would be actually thinking the crops i'm putting in this year brendan i will be thinking three years ahead of what's going in after that or four years ahead let's just say um if you're a conventional farmer no matter what way you plant it you can either go to your local merchant and get get a trace element spray i put on more np and k and that'll sort out the problem or put on a fungicide and things like that but but whereas i have to i i'm farming 
and I farm with nature. So I, I look at the traits of, of each crop that I plant and I know its strengths and weaknesses and I've changed different varieties and things like that. But I'm trying to get away, I'm hoping to get away within the next two years that every crop I grow will be for human consumption and not to go into the food, the animal food chain. Because what that does as well is it increases your profitability and increases, increases your value, your net value per acre. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, Thomas, uh, Brian Walsh wants to know, do you always undersow your organic oats and what do you undersow with? Um, I, I use it, but the more at the start, but let's just say the, the more upskilling I was giving myself and the more I was um, getting into all of this and um, and organics is actually an exciting time at the moment. Now, you're saying to yourself, uh, he's after losing the plot here, he's gone. Organics is exciting. It's exciting from the point of view of the amount of research in Europe that's being done in organics now to make organics more profitable, to make it more accessible and to get more returns and, and, and to basically make the soil more productive, but at the same time, give the soil become more active in a biology sense and things like that. Um, the, the difference is, 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 just, is just phenomenal from, from that point of view, but uh, it's, it's I, the mix I've used now, and I undersaw all my oats, is, is a mix of a crimson clover and, and a, a trefoil and a medic at, at about between 2.7 and 3.5 kgs to the acre. Okay. Um, and um, it, it's now, if anyone has ever seen, I am, I've, someone said to me, what's your favorite plant? Uh, my favorite plant, to be honest, is crimson clover. If any of you seen crimson clover, if you don't know what it is, put it into Google images, right? And you'll be absolutely stunned. Okay, it's the most stunning plant you can ever get. But what it does is it, it, it fixes up to 240 kgs of nitrogen per hectare per year. So, it, you get fantastic value for your money as well, but but it has a biomass and things like that. And as as the the bees love it, the insects, the pollinators absolutely love it. So so it, it's a win win situation. And not only that, then, but as 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 you, your um you, the guy who 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 asked the question, you'll also have a bigger trailer load uh, of oats to take the flavens as well. Brilliant. Um, I'll ask one more question before handing back to Bridget. Uh, we, we, we might have to overrun a little bit tonight, but Barry O'Donoghue, uh, a good carrier man who, who certainly knows his birds, said he was down with you last year and your place is amazing, even if it's in Cork. Uh, the most striking thing about Tom is how he has taken such an independent and brave approach to what he does on his land. What do you think, Tom, um, uh, what do you think uh, allowed, you to, to, allowed you to take this independent outlook? How can farmers stay true to themselves and their land rather than following the typical um, same old model? What policy supports can foster expansive thinking and application? I suppose a ge few general questions there, but maybe you've a, a comment or two to make on them. Um, I suppose, to be honest, what did help me in, in going down this path was I was working off the farm. And I, by trial and error, right? Uh, I, I did have that, I, I did have that buffer by working off the farm that I was able to do some trial and error. And if it didn't work out, then basically, financially, I could, I could cover the likes of that. But if I didn't do it, who else was going to do it, Brendan? How, what other way was I going to find out that what I've done is actually possible. It's not that I didn't set out to do this, to be sitting in here looking at the two of you tonight, right, and ringing me up what I'm doing. I did it actually for myself and as a business and 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 to work with nature because deep down I think it was actually always in me anyways, right? But it took, I must have been a slow learner or something. It took a long time to actually come out. But it, it, it's not for to be on the notoriety or be whatever, it, it's that it's achievable and it's a success and, and it is possible. But when I went down this road, I there was nobody in Ireland that I could turn to. And even if I did, I got the raised eyebrow. 
and they were going, yeah, sure, God love him, he'll be, he'll be all right in time. So I decided, look, forget what other people are saying. It's a bit like when you go organic, okay? The first rule of thumb when you become organic is stop looking at the farmer outside the ditch who's conventional because you must forget everything you've learned in conventional and you must retrain and reskill yourself in to thinking about how plants grow, how nature works, cycles, everything like that. But it's a fantastic journey because it's a journey that will make you smile all the time. No, picking stones won't make me smile. And I still have to do that. I know they're organic stones, but I still have to pick them. So um, um, that's where that's that's where I'm coming from. It's if someone said, "What could people do in Ireland this minute?" Throwing money at 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 a commodity won't work. Tr- upskilling the farmer in 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 a way not not basic upskilling but upskilling in 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 very prudent ways and very prudent avenues uh, from you you should engineer everything from the consumer back to the farm rather than the other way around and i think you're going to have a fantastic success in that line because even bridges and yourselves you know what you're doing is absolutely astounding and and the success of it but look at it in this context right where could you actually go to see the the belt of galloways or you go to see sheep or you go to see organic cheeses or, or oats or you name it in a field and actually say i eat that so you know look look at what we have and build on it i actually think we're just this is around us and we're not it's, it's it's just passing people by but um you have actually brought it to a whole new level and I, I commend you on it. And um, I think you're fantastic for what you're doing. But uh, that's just my rant. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not stopping a... anyway, so you'll know I'm going to keep I'm going to keep trialing <laughs> what I'm doing anyways and things like that. Oh, I think I think it's a great rant. Uh, and before I hand back to Bridget uh, for a few more questions, Thomas, I think I, I, I guess with Farming for Nature, I think we really believe in the power of the farmer to, to share the knowledge and to influence others. And I think you're, you're an exemplar of that. And in terms of information sharing and education, I think I know you've been training all day today, but I think you're very generous in, in sharing your time and your lessons. And I might just say as well to in our chat box, thanks to Claire Lyons, who's sharing some very useful links uh, this and every week. So thank you, Claire. Bridget, back over to you. Great. Thanks, William Brennan. Uh, unbelievable, Thomas, so, uh, quite a pioneer. And do you know what? what's really nice, though, is that because you are beating a path I, I, and sharing your knowledge, I believe other people will follow. And... It's nice that you're so positive about your path, so well done on that. Listen, a uh, quick fire round here now, Thomas, because we have quite a few questions, and I know uh, we're kind of running over time, but because we were kind of dodging it on the phone for a while, we'll carry on. Um, so, Thomas, how deep are your hedgerows, and what do, are you doing any planting into these hedgerows or these ditches? Yeah, oh, I, um, I did some planting of... of um, of white turn and things like that and um but what happened is bridget is because the hedgerows were diverse they've actually come back themselves uh, at a level and a diversity that that tended to be there as well i, I did i have a problem with one ditch at the moment and uh, it, there is a colony of rabbits in it that's absolutely mind-boggling and uh, they do like any any of the young trees that i'm planting there even from the point of view of even by putting the guards up maybe a half a meter they must be standing in its other shoulders at night and things like that and eating the tops <laughs> off them but but i i get around that i get around that at, at another stage and um um it's taken time right but what has happened nothing seemed to have been happening for a couple of years until until the until let's say I got away from the chemical side of it and nature started taking its course and then it was like an explosion it basically just took off in every direction and um, you know let's say even from smelling wild garlic and things like that and um, like I said uh, there, there's something new in the hedgerows all the time and um, you know let's say one one evening there I'm talking about the hedgehogs and stuff like that, but one evening there, there was a rabbit passing the passage, but he was passing the passage with his legs up in the air. And I was going, how is he managing to do this? And, and it was actually um, 
a stoat, okay. a big rabbit, but it was like um, it was like a magician. Magician. <laughs> the stoat had him up on his back, and the stoat was and, and I never saw the stoat, and there was the rabbit with the four legs up in the air going across the passage like this, and I'm going. <laughs> Uh, this, if I was drinking, I would say yes, but uh, <laughs> pa- pa- pantomime with that. But but mm. but but if Bridget, you've seen it, uh, and I have a pond and that as well, and um, you, you can see it, the duck come in in the evenings and um, things like that. And um, I, I was actually, I, I actually have a flock of birds at the moment that are around with a couple of since 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 September. And I don't actually know what they are. There's about 70 in it. And there's been a few. Um, uh, what I would have is, is is I would have guys who, who there's a guy who uh, who walks the fields and that he trains dogs and mm. um, he just loves the scents uh, in, in my fields and that. And he's 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 a guy in his 70s and he said, what are the flock of birds in the field? He says, I've never seen them before. I don't actually know what they are. But 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 they're quite unusual. But I, I must find out what they are, and uh, they don't seem to be leaving the place at all. But um, they're bigger than a starling, and um, they're brown on top, but they have a slight whitish underbelly. But but look, Bridget, it, it's 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 this happened. I suppose you could say nature decided to start managing the farm itself mm. because I, I I was interacting with nature, right? And and, and it's it's symbiotic because minimum tillage. Um, because I don't invert the soil every year, right? What I would have as well as the likes of millipedes and centipedes and the likes of, um, I would have a lot of, shrew- of, um, of, of shrews and mice and things like that. And, and what I have is I have buzzards back. I have a kite. I have sparrow hawks coming out my tonsils because of, of all the small birds. And um, when I went in, uh, another, if people are worried about about the likes of when I went in first about slugs, take something as simple as slugs. The first thing one guy told me is I was going to get wiped out with slugs, and I never have. And the reason being that because I have a diversity, and because of the the, the by the mint tillage, I, I, I do have. I, I do have the, the predators of the slugs there as well. And basically it keeps everything in a balance. Mm. No, it's a functioning farm. This is not, you know, and some people say, oh, that sounds idyllic, but it's still a functioning farm. It's a farm that's feeding um, high level crops, but at the same time, right, nature is involved in it. And they're quite happy with me at the well at, at the moment. And I'm getting on grand with them. Maybe if mm-hmm. I had less rabbits, it's probably about the only thing I, I could deal with. But yeah, it's anyways, an interesting, that's, that's uh, question, like you anyway. say, the balance, the kind of the pest control. You'll need to get that Kerry man, Barry Dante, again. He's quite good with the birds, as Brendan says. Um, <laughs> listen, uh, a couple of questions here for you now. I'll pile a couple of them together. Brian asks, how many years do you grow organic ro- oats in your rotation? And Elise asks, how do you manage your bars? Do they take over? Um, uh, I grow two years oats. I grow two years oats in a row, okay, mm-hmm. normally. And I, I diversified I, I, for for a build up of mosaic virus and stuff like that, even though it don't affect spring crops, but but you actually do get a build up. But a lot of it is down to the diversity of my rotation. Now I, I would love if I had more land because my rotation would get totally diverse then. But but it, it's constraining me at the moment, and maybe that's a good thing. Um, um briars, the briars. Are, are cut back every other year, but they're only brought back to where they were in the first place. They're still fruit and things like that. But when you are a, an organic farmer, the briars, because you're not feeding them with artificial fertilizers, um, they will not they will not take over. Just remember this, Bridget, right? Other than cash crops, we call them weeds, our briars are 70% more efficient at using uh, artificial fertilizers than cash crops, mm-hmm. 70% more. Okay, interesting. Uh, Denise asks, what kind of what machinery do you have different machinery for different crops? What machinery do you use? No, I'm actually very practical. Um, every crop I've grown so far, I do not any I do not need any specialist machinery. Uh, everything is cut with a combine and it will it will do so. And it, it, that that's why I, I looked at a lot of these crops. It, you're not you do not have any extra investment and um all my machines tend to be secondhand, and um, there's nothing wrong with that. Shiny gear, okay. Shiny gear will not make a profit, but well, you have to pay for it as well, right? But but 
if you will invest in the likes of cover cropping and invest in different species of clovers and things like that, that's what will give you your return back and to the soil that will give you your profit, not the shiny gear. So but there's one thing I do do, and, and I, I, may, I was conscious of it when I started first, every implement that goes on behind the back of the tractor is not power driven. I do not beat the soil into submission with a PTO. It's not power driven. It's driven either with a cultivation that's pulled through it or a disc rolling. So that way I try not to try and beat the soil into submission. And, and I basically, I, I will not go out until conditions are absolutely perfect. Okay, perfect. Uh, Caroline asks, is it possible to add protein to haylage by direct sowing to an existing old meadow? Um, it is, is, but it can be slightly complicated. Um, from the point of view, I, I'll make this short. Um, because the old meadow is dominant, and it's a dominant species. Um, if you put something else in at the time, the dominant species will tend and try and control it. So what you do is you actually try and scarify back the old meadow to put that under a small amount of stress so that the protein crop will actually take off in it. It's stitching in and things like that is quite common, but there's rules a way of doing it so it's a success it's no good if you don't do it follow it properly and everyone going oh that never worked but mm. if you followed a few simple rules by by, by cutting it back and pairing it back yes it's it's very it can be very success, successful um I, I saw you got a one there uh, why do not why do i not have cattle um why i do not have cattle is that it was a tillage farm i have no fencing i have no water to the fields and I have no buildings for cattle. So if I wanted to get into cattle for what I have in a rotation basis, it would be cost prohibitive. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so Flicky, how- I have two, do I have two dogs. And your two dogs, what? You have animals, there you go. Uh, Flicky asks, I'd love to hear about the flowers you're growing, where and how are you selling them? Um, basically, I'm, I'm selling them farmer to farmer and I'm basically, um, sell them to other processes and things like that and um it, it's the more diversity is the more i'm growing and things like that i've actually i've actually even exported stuff at times and that mm. but uh brexit has put a stop to that and that's okay. that's probably a good thing as well because um that there's more demand nowadays internally yeah yeah brilliant and actually hazel asked before this um uh, do, you, do you have to process much before you go straight to your market or do you just sell the raw product no, um, a lot of it is is, is cleaning and separating, uh, mainly cleaning. They, they want the, the, the raw crop, but they do not want an admixture. They'll take a certain amount, but if it's above that, then basically once it comes off the combine, it's dried and it's cleaned a couple of times and um, or it's half dried, cleaned again and dried again. And um, I will either keep some for animal feed or some for human consumption and things like that. But um, it, it's, 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 it's a growing market and... Um, I'm in the process of um, applying for some funding to get a, a serious cleaning machine. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> That's fair enough. Uh, so, Marcos, um, yeah. do you consider carbon nitrogen ratios when selecting cover crop species? Um, very much so. Okay, and um, the carbon nitrogen. I, I I had a problem with that at the start, and that's why I undersaw a lot of my, my cereal crops because cereal straw on crops are very high uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio of up to 70 to 80 percent to one, where, whereas you can get clovers down to 22 to 27 uh, to one. And um, by balancing those out, that's what I do. The, um, legumes are very important um, because the legume straw breaks down a lot easier and the legumes promote the likes of myceliums and the myceliums are actually break down the straw faster again. And, and, and that's at another angle and you have your earthworms and things like that getting involved in all of that as well. And um, by, not, by not deep tillage, your vertical earthworms, which I, they're, they're the ones I'm more interested in, um, they are the ones I want to leave intact at, at a lower level. So um, they tend to stay down below my cultivations when the ground gets dry, they, they follow the moisture down. So um, 
I balance my carbon to nitrogen ratio that way. And that's a very good question. And it, it, does, it takes a bit of time to do it. But when you balance the likes of that, Bridget, your microbiology benefit and your crops benefit from, from the nutrient availability from the microbiology. Fascinating, isn't it? It's kind of like a biology class as opposed to a chemistry. You know, you a lot of farmers are in chemistry classes, and you're you're going off into your biology class next door. Biology um, class. Come here, uh, dear dear wants to know. She has ten acres. Do you think it's viable to start producing crops on ten acres with machinery, etc.? Or, or I suppose what's viable when you don't know where people's starting point is. Well, if you look at it this way, if you look at it this way, Bridget. Um, if you have 10 acres, um, do you want, if you have 10 acres only and you want to make a return from it, you would have to look at some very high value cropping okay. in the 10 acres. Now, that, that could be, that question could be as long as how long is a piece of string. You know, you can go from horticulture all the way up to medicinal cropping. So mm -hmm. there's, if she looks into it, yes, there is but it should be done on an organic basis okay, because you, that extra margin is there from that. Yeah. We're just going to take a few more questions. I mean, are you okay, Thomas? You're not rushing off to watch the nine o'clock news or anything. I've kept you well over your time, but... Um, uh, so not in the slightest. It's Monday night. <laughs> and I know you've been teaching all day as well. Uh, Thomas is actually running a course at the moment with knots on... A, 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 it's a four four-day course, I think. So I think it can be found on the Knots website and people can join it re retrospectively, maybe find it on YouTube or something. But um, Anne-Maria wants to know what oat variety do you, um, do you grow? Sorry, I didn't get that, Sorry, the start of that oats, question. Oat variety do you grow? What type of oats do you grow? Oh, um, it's our spring oats. And um, I, um, I tend to, um, I tend to grow a mix of Isabel, Husky and Canyon. Okay, thanks. Uh, and then uh, Dennis, he wants to know, uh, like you've obviously seen lots of increases and in changes in wildlife in your farm, but do you, do, you ha do you carry out surveys or does anyone carry out surveys for you to know what your changes are going? Um, no, um, but my, my, um, the way I would look at it is 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 performance based, and um, performance based from 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 the soil becoming more biologically active, and basically everything around me. So n nobody has any taken any interest in any the likes of what I'm doing. But but from what I am doing, right, from where I started to where I am now, is in no relation. Bottom, they're in no relation to the same as jumping outside the ditch to the other side of the farm at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's like jumping into a sterile environment. Brilliant. Uh, there's a lady here, Kay Quinn. She just wants to tell you that she's so inspired by what you're telling her tonight. She's going to make a PowerPoint for her ag science students tomorrow so they can learn all about your <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> the education continues. Um, and there's, some lovely, there's lots of lovely comments here about, you know, your truly farming soil and... Um, you know, hopefully that will give you profit and stuff. Um, Thomas, you've been really, really generous with your time. And despite our technical difficulties, you you were like shackled in, you kept going, you came on through and, uh, and we saw you here. So that's great. Thank you so much for your inspiration. And as we like, I mean, I can't say it enough. You really are a pioneer, obviously, in this whole area in Ireland. And it's, it's just fascinating to get the opportunity to speak to you and you know, and for other people to be able to listen to what you're what you're trying out, and I mean, I know it's that kind of stereotypical AIB ad we're backing brave, but like there's some serious brave carry on going up there, going on there up in North Cork, and um, so well done. It's a uh, it's it's very inspirational, and what you've achieved and what you continue to achieve, and I love the way that you're always looking. Like you're thinking years ahead, but you're also looking at new ideas the whole time and your reasoning behind it as well. So, do you know, th thank you for that. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, so for anyone that missed uh, part of tonight or um, knows someone who would like to uh, listen to tonight's session, it should be up on our YouTube channel by tomorrow evening, um, hopefully if internet allows. And uh, Thomas is actually carrying out a walk for us, uh, Farming for Nature walk. 
uh, COVID allowing um, on 3rd of July. There's a waiting list, so we haven't opened bookings yet because we don't know what the restrictions will be uh, in the summer. But go to our, our, our homepage, farmingfornature.ie, and you can actually join a waiting list. So when the bookings do open, you'll be notified and then you can book. And uh, so we're delighted that, uh, that Thomas is, is joining us. Um, someone's here saying, watch out for the Cork Mafia there, Thomas. And uh, <laughs> as I'm based in Cork as well, I'm with you, don't worry. And, um, but, uh, and the farm walk won't be filmed, unfortunately. But, um, but yeah, so the farm walk is on 3rd of July. But there'll be opportunities, again, if you're unable to make the farm walk, there'll be opportunities like this again, hopefully, to have a conversation with Tom. And like I say, he's also uh, carrying out different courses online through KNOTS, which is the National Skill Set uh, Training Skill Set, um, National Organic Training Skill Set Group. And um, if you have any questions for any of our ambassadors, like Tom, we do have an online forum, so feel free to join our forum, write your questions in there, and different ambassadors will get back to you. And finally, next week is the final in our series of Ask the Farmer Q&A sessions. Um, so, and um, with, uh, with Mimi Crawford from County Tipperary. So do join us, do register as you have for this one. And finally, thank you so much again, uh, Thomas. Like, absolutely brilliant. Lovely to speak to you. Lovely to hear your stories, your farm. And I just love the way every single farm that we've had on this series is just so different, but has such a great story to tell. And I know a lot of our audience, a lot of the same people are turning up every week. And I'm sure everyone's mind is, is just blown by all the stuff that they can do and achieve and different angles they can go down and still, what I love is the beautiful kind of positivity that you know you have for your farm and that you actually enjoy walking around your farm and you know and that's really important and I think that uh, you, you know you and Brendan were talking about the kind of the social aspect of farming how important that is and um, Thomas is there any other final words you'd like to leave us with or pieces of advice for any farmer out there uh, conventional or otherwise um, that, that you would like to leave us with? Words of wisdom from Mr. Brave. Well, uh, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank you very much and, um, and Brendan as well. And um, um, what you have done is actually, is, is, is probably a walk and like you said, so many farmers are actually doing so many good things and your ambassadors and things like that. I actually know Mimi Crawford next weekend uh, and um, uh, it's sensational what these people are doing and and it, they're not doing it for, for, for the sake of, you know, look at me, what I'm doing. They're doing it because they want to do it and um, you're championing things like that and whatever. But, but what I would say to people is, is don't be afraid to ask and don't be afraid to actually jump in and try things out. And um, from, from a conventional side, if so, can I, can I, can I have one minute and I will give a conventional farmer something that yeah. they can actually do. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, a word of something that you can try. Okay. People should always get, if they put in something into this, they should try and get something back out of themselves from nature as well by working together. If there's dairy farmers listening tonight, conventional, okay? What I would love you to do is this, okay? I would like you on an east or a west facing strip in a paddock, I would like you to fence it back out five metres, okay? And I would like you to put in an altilamentic strip of herbs, which are their chicory and plantains and things like that. You, there's an altilamentic strip you can get for it. But what I would like you to do as well as this is, I want, I would love you to put in some, 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 a flower, uh, um, uh, um, a meadow flower mix into them as well. Okay. What you're doing as well as this is, you will have a mix for your pollinators, but you will also have a mix that you let the cows in or your cattle in so that the altilamentic herbs will be a benefit because if you fence them in for a few hours and take them back out of it again, what it is is this. People at the moment are talking about uh, multi-species swords and putting the likes of, the, of altilamentic herbs into it. The persistence in multi-species swords because of the cost does not is not financially beneficial and the cow has to eat too much grass as well as the antilamentic herbs to have an effect whereas if you put them into a strip for a couple of hours 
they will eat the herbs and come back out of it again and fence it off. And what you can do is they can do it from the other side in a rotation of 27 or 8 days or whatever. But it also means you have a pollinator strip as well. So you're working with nature and you're working for yourself. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. That was the tart of the day. How's that? That's a good one. Well, yeah, also, it's, it's, it's dipping the toe in the water, like you say. Like, you know, I think that's really important yes. for everyone. You know, you don't have to feel you have to go the whole hog straight away. But, I mean, if you can dip the toe in the water and see the benefits of it, um, both for your cattle, you know, what they're eating, but also for your kind of for your grasses and for obviously wildlife, then, do you know, no harm. Dip the toe in the water, see how you get on. Do you know what I mean? Thomas, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Brendan, thanks for joining me. And everyone else, uh, thanks for joining us as well. Uh, hopefully we'll see you all next week uh, for Mimi's One, which is our last one in the series. Um, otherwise, have a good week. And hopefully you won't all get too wet now tomorrow with the lashings of rain that's what, that we're due. Thomas, you're a, very, you're a star. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Cheers. Take care. Bye, Brendan. Yeah.